to be like Christ. Brock just read for us from that 18th chapter of the book of John. In John's account of Jesus, there's these people who are coming out. They're coming to, to destroy Jesus. They're coming to arrest him. And he asked them, who do you want? They tell him, Jesus of Nazareth. They didn't know Jesus. They didn't even know who, what he looked like. He said, I'm he. What do they do? Oh, they expect him to, to fight back. What does he do? He asks them again, who are you looking for? I am he. Jesus was perfectly at peace with doing the will of God. The will of his father. Sometimes we're, we might think we're at peace with doing God's will, but when it really comes down to it, do we really do? Today, this morning, I want to talk about growing our faith. And again, this is a, uh, one of those basic lessons. And I want to talk to you today about, we, we understand what faith is. We believe in God. We, otherwise, we wouldn't be here this morning. We believe in God. We believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And so we, we have based our decisions in life off of that. But what do we do? Have you ever reached a point in your life that I know my life is, goes through phases where, where it's, like, it's like, yes, I'm growing, I'm learning. And then all of a sudden you're just you reach a, a, a point where you where you almost become stagnant, neutral. You're not really growing, you're just you're just there. So I was thinking about that that as I with this lesson. I've said it before, I'll say it again. When it comes to growing faith. And when it comes to worshiping God, serving God, by default, we as human beings, we've got, we've, God only gave us 24 hours in the day, seven days in a week. And we try to cram as much into those, those days as possible. By default, there are things we don't accomplish. So by default, we do what is most important to us. My wife clipped my wings this week. She very kindly, very lovingly, and I'm not exaggerating and I'm not making fun of that. She very kindly said, honey, I think you're too busy. You're not spending as much time in study as you should. She's right. She's right. I kind of have allowed myself to get caught up in the, the summer hustle and bustle and trying to accomplish this job and that job and, you know, all these different things. So when we get to a place like that, what do we do? How do, how do, how do we expand our faith? Well, in a world of rising costs, we, we all of us see the need to work hard to obtain financial security. I think it was last week that I said, and I can't remember if it was in, in Bible class or in worship service. Last week, I, I made note that I had heard that, 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 that there were, it was in, in a financial report of some sort, um, that, that people were for the first time ever taking out loans, credit card loans for vacations that would probably take the average person who took those loans out would take them four years to pay back. Now, that just seems like a bad idea. We all understand that. We see that. We, we live with what we know of as inflated prices, inflation, and we see it. So I don't know what it does for you, but for me, I see it and I say, oh, we've got to work extra hard. We've got to take on another, another project, another job to make up for those inflated prices. What, what about our faith? 
Does it get pushed aside? Yeah, kind of mine has. Everything we work for in life, that will eventually go away. It doesn't matter what it is. We talked this morning about the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 9, talking about a will or a testament being in effect, in effect only after a person is dead. The truth is, we might have earthly possessions when we die, but my kids really aren't going to care about much of my stuff. To them, you know, my dad, my dad is a pack rat. I'll make no secret about it. I, and he would probably very grudgingly admit to it. Dad's a pack rat. You've ever been out to my parents' place? There's piles of what I consider to be debris. My dad calls them projects or valuables. I've told my sister, when dad dies, guess what? You get to clean it all up. And I said, I don't want anything to do with it. You can have all of those mountains of debris. My brother, when he was living, used to say, clean it up. He's like, I'm going to bring in a big dumpster. Dad would go, rah, 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 rah. the truth is, most of what we have has no value to anyone but us. And it will eventually all go away. I want you to turn with me Gospel of John chapter 6 for just a moment. And just it just reminds us of what is what is important here. Don't get me wrong, I've got my stuff too. And yes, I have what my wife would term as piles of debris. In John chapter 6, and in verse 27, Jesus says, Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. In other words, the work of God is to believe in Jesus Christ. Okay. I think that's a very elementary principle. I believe that everyone in this building who's of an age of accountability and probably some who are under an age of accountability believe in God and they believe in Jesus. But how do we continue? From that point on, how do we continue to grow our faith? To expand it in our knowledge and understanding of the Word of God. I think the first thing for us to do is to lay it on the altar. In this picture that you see in the upper corner of the screen, it is a, it is a picture of what we would call an Old Testament altar. I don't know exactly how accurate it is, but you'll notice on that altar there's smoke. And what would appear to be the mangled corpse of an animal. Under the Old Testament law, God's people offered animal sacrifices to remind themselves of their sins, imperfections, and shortcomings. They simply reminded them of how imperfect they really were. Oddly enough, pagans around the world offered sacrifices to their gods. Some of them offered human sacrifices, but lots of animal sacrifices were offered. So when the Apostle Paul makes his statement in Romans chapter 12, 
in verses 1 and 2 of that chapter. If you'll go back there with me, let's, I want to read that statement. Romans chapter 12, Paul says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your, your King James will say, and I believe it's more accurate, perhaps in translation, your reasonable service. The English Standard Version says it is our spiritual worship. What it means, what Paul means, is it is not unreasonable for us to offer ourselves to God. He goes on in verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That's what I want to talk to you today about is, is growing our faith to where we can test, to where we can discern what the will of God is. Because Just because we begin at the basic level of understanding that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and we have faith and trust in him, then we need to expand our faith in order to have that understanding of what God's will is. But I find it interesting that, that the Apostle Paul first says that we have to sacrifice ourselves. And we, we talked a little bit about that last week. Remember when a person obeys the gospel, they are purchased. They are purchased. And quite frankly, we're purchased even before we obey the gospel. The price has already been paid, which should in and of itself motivate us to obedience to the gospel. Peter, Peter words it this way. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and in verse... 18 and 19. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18, Peter says, Knowing that you were ransomed, some translations use the word purchased, from the, ex, from the fertile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver or gold. In other words, we've been purchased with things not like money. He says, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He says we've been purchased. Like the, the sacrifice on the altar. Christ laid down his blood for us. And so in the effort to be Christ-like, we also should lay down our lives for Christ. I want you to look at 1 Corinthians for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And in verse 19, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and in verse 19, here the Apostle Paul, and I've referenced this recently in the past, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So we got to be willing to do that. We talked about that last week, putting our, our lives on the altar. To put ourselves on the altar means to sacrifice our wants and desires. Instead, do what God wants for us. We have to put our wants and desires aside. Now, that's first step. That's first phase. That's where I want to add on to what we talked about last week. Secondly, a person must have a willing mind or a willing heart to follow God. A person with a willing heart to follow God will always, will always accomplish great things because God has the ability to shape you 
I want you to think about this. Has, I don't know if anybody in here has ever messed with pottery or not. But pottery is interesting. A lot of times we look and think of pottery and we think of our dishes. Well, most of our dishes that we use today are, are just stamped in a mold. Mass production. But if you've ever messed with pottery, and I believe Celia's messed with pottery a little bit, pot, a potter takes a, a, a blob of clay and molds that blob of clay. It's on a, it's on a potter's wheel. And it turns in a circle. And with their hand, they shape that pot out of a lump of clay. We've got to be moldable. God can take a lump of clay and mold it into whatever he wants it to be, provided in order to work clay, it has to be of the right consistency, the right type, the right amount of moisture. There's so many things that come into, into play. And the first thing I want to talk about is a willing mind. Having the ability to allow God to shape and mold us goes completely against human nature. The Apostle Paul says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and in verse 12 of that chapter, for if the readiness is there, it is acceptable. In other words, you may not be perfect. You may not be a mature Christian. But if you have a readiness of mind and a willingness to serve God, God can do whatever he wants to with you. Paul says, according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. God is not going to judge you on the abilities that you don't have. God is not going to judge you on the wonderful attributes that you don't have. What God is going to judge us on Were you ready to serve me? Were you willing to serve? I want you to go back with me into our Old Testament. I believe it's Solomon speaking here in 1 Chronicles chapter 28 to his son. I'm not positive of that. Uh, I don't remember for sure. But there's a statement here that I want us to read. 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and in verse 9. I'm sorry, it's David to Solomon. David says, And you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him Look at, how, look at how David says to serve God. With a whole heart, that means completely. With a whole heart and with a willing mind. It's amazing. It's amazing what God can add to our lives, how he can enrich our lives. Solomon is a great example of this. Not a perfect man. You won't find a perfect man in the Bible outside of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. But Solomon, as a young man, had a willing mind, a willingness to serve God, and God blessed him with wisdom and understanding. Later in life, midlife hit, Solomon kind of had problems. He allowed his desires to get in the world. His mind was no longer willing to serve God, and he was chastised for that. Solomon said, at the end of his life, I believe Solomon returned to God. He wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. 
the book of Proverbs in his later years, encouraging his children and us today to have that willing mind. To have a willing mind is to be moldable, pliable. In Jeremiah chapter 18, Jeremiah learns a lesson about Israel from God. And Jeremiah learns the importance of being moldable. Jeremiah chapter 18 verse 1 the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. You see, pottery, one of the great things about pottery, thousands of years of history, pottery hasn't changed. It's one of those things that's consistent. It still is made basically the same way. Oh, yes, we've got an electric motor on our wheel. But it is still made the same way, and so we can get an idea. I talked to a potter one time. She told me, she said, you know, clay has a mind of its own. That's the challenge with working with clay. She said some types of clay are more flexible than others. Some types of clay... There, you might be working on a pitcher, and you might have the basic shape of the pitcher, and you get to the very lip of it, and the clay might droop. And you have to, you have to take that section of clay out and work in a little bit of drier clay to make that section of the of the lip of the pitcher to stand upright. So Jeremiah said, So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled. Something, something went wrong. The clay didn't work. It was spoiled in the potter's hand. And he reworked it into another vessel. It seemed good to the potter. You know what he did? He took that thing that didn't work out, and he mashed it down. He took his hands, smashed that vessel but that didn't work, and he began again. Sometimes things don't work out in our lives. Sometimes things just don't work out in our lives, and, and God, just, God just has a way of just, just taking and putting things back to the basics and starting all over again. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. And if, it in, if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. If at any time declare, if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it up, plant it, and it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I intended to do to it. Now therefore says the Lord, or say, now therefore say to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of the nation, thus says the Lord, behold, I am shaping disaster against you and devising a plan against you. Return every one from his evil way and mend your deeds. God can take, He can shape us. Sometimes we don't even know why God's shaping us. But He can take and shape us and mold us. Make sure that we remain quiet. Next, we need each other. In order to grow our faith, 
Faith doesn't grow well on its own. Here, try raising sweet corn on us. When I went, to, I, I guess where my brother lives at in Alaska, sweet corn doesn't grow well. And maybe that's because they had frost in July this year. They had frost in June. They had frost in July. They'll have frost in August. I don't think there's going to be a month this year that they're not going to have frost in Alaska where he lives. I think it's retarded for anybody to want to live there. But, you know, I'll leave that to him, and I'll leave that to my friends in Alaska. That's their decision. But when I went to Alaska, I noticed something. April 25th, snow on the ground. Not fresh snow, but piles of snow. I went to a greenhouse. I never saw cucumbers in hanging baskets. But that's how they raise cucumbers in Alaska. They put them in hanging baskets and they get the little pickles off of them and pick them. I noticed something else. Sweet corn. Whoever thought you grow sweet corn in a pot? We put it in the garden. You know what's wrong with growing sweet corn in a pot? Pollination. It doesn't pollinate well. Sweet corn is something that takes other plants in order to pollinate and produce. Christians need other Christians in order to pollinate and produce. There's a couple of different reasons for this. Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17, iron sharpened iron. Let's go back there for just a moment. I, I want to read it in, a, in, in its context in its entirety. Book of Proverbs, chapter 27, and in verse 17. Solomon, in leaving words of wisdom and how to grow, how to be of a willing mind, Solomon says, Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. Why do you think it's important for us to come together for open discussion Bible studies? Often, you have no idea how much I learned during our Bible studies. Someone asks a question. I've got to come up with the answer. Sometimes someone brings a point that I completely missed. Iron sharpens iron. One man, one person, one person's faith and understanding of a particular passage brings a whole new perspective on it. And secondly, it also creates an accountability for each other. If we're off by ourselves and we're not part of a local body of believers, we don't have each other, there's no accountability. And there's certainly no safety net. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 12, and we've not gotten to this in our Sunday morning Bible studies yet, but in Hebrews chapter 12, and in verse 12, the Hebrew writer puts it this way. He says, therefore lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. Make straight the path for your feet, so that that which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness, for the holiness without which one, which no one will see the Lord. We work together. One person's weakness is another's strength. One person's failing is another's triumph. And we help each other. There is accountability and there is a safety net. In Luke chapter 10, I'll, I'll not go back there for time's sake this morning, but in Luke chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus sends out 72 ministers, 72 disciples he sends out, not one at a time, but two at a time. He sends them out two by two because they need each other. And finally, my final point, is this, to seek first 
Where do our priorities lie? What is most important? What are we doing by default? Matthew chapter 6, Jesus gives a, a little parable here. And he follows that by saying this. Matthew chapter 6. Oh, down in verse 25. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious for your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Now I tell you what. It's like Jesus is speaking those words directly into my life certain times he says it's not life more than food and the body more than clothing look at the birds of the air they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns yet your heavenly father feeds them are you not more valuable than they and which of you being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life and why are you anxious about clothing consider the lilies of the field how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will you not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. The Gentiles, the non-believers. Your heavenly Father knows that you have need of them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Growing faith means that it has to be our top priority. And finally, I want to ask you a question. What, what do you see when you read Hebrews chapter 2? Turn there with me. Hebrews chapter 2, 1 through 3. I'll let you answer this in your own minds, in your own hearts. But I, want, I wonder if you see and feel, when you read these words, what I see and feel. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. Now, the English Standard Version here says, lest we drift away from it. And that's a very accurate translation. But the King James Version says, lest we let it slip. And when I see that in the King James Version Bible, what I get in my mind is a picture of a man who is holding a rope. He's come to the end of that rope. And he knows as he's hanging from this rope, if he lets go, he's going to fall. The Hebrew writer says, and let me, let me read it to you this way. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. And I'm going to insert my thoughts here, so take it for what it's worth, my thoughts lest when we get to the end of the rope, we let it slip. He says, For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape? This is important. How shall we, as New Testament Christians, escape if we neglect such a great salvation? What do you see? I suspect a hundred people could read that and a hundred people could see a different vision when they see, read what the Hebrew writer's writing. But he's making a very serious point of where you are. He'll take out your song.